Coming up next on Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable, the latest on funding restoration for career and technical education, and we'll discuss the curious battle over public safety pension reform. The Journalists Roundtable is next on Arizona Horizons. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining us tonight, Mary Jo Pitzel of the Arizona Republic, Bob Christie of the Associated Press, and Jeremy Duda of the Arizona Capital Times. Last year, the governor and legislature approved $30 million in cuts to joint technical education districts, which focus on career and technical education. But it looks like most of those cuts are not going to take effect. At least that's the way, it, I mean, it, are they going to take effect? It looks like, what's going on? Here? Well, if the legislature has its way, no, those cuts will not take effect because after enacting them and then going home to their districts and hearing from the school districts that sponsor these uh, training programs, they realized, oh, this, this could really, really hurt educational uh, goals. So Senator Shooter uh, ran a bill, uh, he introduced it a couple weeks ago with I think 70 co-sponsors out of 90. That uh, shows overwhelming support. So it's got a lot of support, it just doesn't have a final vote yet. It, what, what changed? I mean, I mean, was it the outcry that strong? I know it seemed like everyone was talking about this early and even before the session started, but goodness gracious, this was passed by the legislature, signed by the governor, and now oops? Yeah, oops. Oops happened almost immediately after the, the budget was passed last March. The, the lawmakers went home to their district for the weekend and they came back going, oh my gosh. They started getting hammered because these technical education districts are designed to help High school kids who really aren't on a career path to college, they're not going to go to college. They, you know, they, they get classes for mechanics and nursing assistants and welders and all these other trades that, that really allow them to get them right out of high school and it keeps them engaged. The graduation rate is 90% as opposed to 72%. So the lawmakers got an earful and then that just built up over the last eight months. When they came back into session, there was a veto-proof majority to repeal them. Yeah, and I think what we've, uh, the surprise that we've all had this session is how controversial, or I guess how many hiccups you can have with a piece of legislation that is supported by almost every single person at the Capitol, certainly at the legislature. You had a, you know, a version of this introduced in each chamber, and the thinking for a while was the big hiccup was going to be Governor Ducey. You know, instead of restoring 28 million of this funding, he wanted th you know, 30 million over three years with these competitive grants, and the governor decides who gets it. And we all, there was, there was certainly a line of thought that this is just kind of a bargaining chip. They figure, you know, for the budget, the legislature seems like they're going to kind of force it, you know, force the issue on Ducey. And then all of a sudden, the two chambers are fighting over this, over, and really it seems like it's devolved into a, an issue of who gets the credit. I yeah, know there's, there's yeah, technical yeah. issues, but. Well, who, what's the fight over? I, I, I agree. I think it's, I think a lot of it is who gets the credit. And we have um, Senator Shooter, um, who um, is the appropriations chairman over in the Senate. That's the committee that sort of started the ball rolling a year ago on, on budget cuts. Um, and in the House, we have his seatmate, interestingly, um, Majority Leader Steve Montenegro, um, who is looking to move over to the Senate. We have a speaker who is looking to run for, who is planning to run for Congress. Um, so it's a question of whose name gets on the bill. Is that basically, I mean, everyone's rushing to be the first to say we screwed up? Uh, it, they don't want to cast it that. They want to say that we're the ones who restored it. Now, the Democrats, of course, will say, listen, we stood up and screamed and said, don't make these cuts. It's going to kill technical education. And Eric Meyer, the minority leader in the House, came over to me the other day and he says, you know, they lit the schoolhouse on fire. You can't come in a year later with a bucket, put out the fire, and call yourself a hero when you're the one who started it. So this bill has been held up twice this week? Held up twice this week. It was due for a vote. It passed the House. Uh, or it was due for a vote in the Senate, and uh, we were all ready for it to go up on the board, and suddenly the governor's office called the, the president of the Senate and said, we need to talk. And so there was all this talk that, well, maybe there was a veto threat involved, maybe there was a, a threat from the governor to uh, not sign it unless he got what he wanted on the budget. This, the Senate president denies that, but they went up to the governor's office with the speaker and the Senate president. They had a meeting, they came down, and all was well. So they, they voted it out, and then it went over to the House, <laughs> and the House was angry because they had made a small change in the Senate, and so it's stuck over there now because of this fight over who gets credit. Yeah, and the argument over this, uh, this one change that, that the you know, Senator Shooter says was needed to ensure that, uh, you know, 
high school seniors, 18 year olds who are part of this program aren't going to get cough, cut off immediately. The fight over this is the play by play has been kind of fun because, you know, the folks in the House say, well, well, gee, we offered to put this on the bill in the first place. And the folks in the Senate told us it's not necessary. We send it over to the Senate. All of a sudden they say it's necessary and we're going to swap out Senator Shooter's bill for you know, Representative Olson's bill, then send it back to the House. Now you have a House that hasn't scheduled this for a vote because they have to revote on it now. And, you know, they haven't budged on that. The Senate could just pass the original House version that went to them now that because now the House says, well, gee, that amendment wasn't really necessary in the first place. Neither side is budging so far, but someone's going to have to eventually. So as we clear the weeds, which are now over our heads yes. in this whole thing, the bottom line is everyone wants this. Mm -hmm. Everyone thinks it's going to pass. Everyone expects the governor to sign it, and yet it sits. It does. It sits, and that shows you how some of the internal dynamics at the legislature work. It re this is one of those things that reinforces it really is a lot like high school down there. I mean, like, can we keep our eye on the bigger picture, which is getting this money to the schools so that there's some predictability in, in, in their plans going forward? But no, 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 we don't worry so much on that higher level. It's all about um, who gets their name on the and, bill. And there are some cuts in this bill. There's, it was a $30 million cut. This bill, after some negotiation back and forth, brings it to the the cut is only is uh, is twenty eight. Right? Well, it's, they restore they cut thirty. They're restoring twenty eight. So there's a two million dollar overall cut. They're going to cut off high school graduates who have already graduated who are still in the programs. They're going to put in some accountability because there was among President Biggs and some others there was concern that there was school districts were gaming the system. So there are some minor reforms in here, but overall they get most of their money back. All right. Uh, <laughs> That drama, uh, I guess, stay tuned for that with the conclusion there, in a moi. Uh, public safety pension reform, drama there too. I thought everyone thought this was a great idea, and now what, what's happening there? Well, this has been negotiated for several years. The pension fund is in a world of hurt, the police and firefighters pension fund. They've got $12.5 billion in liabilities. That's how much they owe their retirees and the people now working and they only have six and a half billion dollars worth of assets. So the cities and towns have been having to pay huge amounts of money to, to fund that. If you have a hundred thousand dollar police lieutenant, you have to pay fifty thousand dollars on top of that for his pension. And that's going to go on for 20 years. Well, they've been trying to come up with a plan. Debbie Lesko negotiated the deal with the cities and the towns and the counties and the firefighters, came up with this great plan. She was hoping for unanimous support. It passed out of the Senate, got to the House, and the conservatives there said, wait a minute, your numbers don't work out, you're not saving any money, um, and we're worried that if your numbers are wrong, it's going to cost more, and why didn't you get more out of the police and firefighters? Yeah. Well, I mean, you can argue that, look, the House is doing what it should do. You, you want to do due diligence. You don't want to just, you know, pass things blindly. Um, but given that th this also crossed paths with the, the technical and career uh, funding um, yesterday, and one was being held hostage to the other. Um, the urgency with pension reform is that to make these changes, if the legislature so wants those, they need to send it to the ballot for voter approval. Yes. The desire is to get it on the May 17th ballot along with the education lawsuit settlement. And the deadline for getting the whole uh, mechanism moving on that election is really is Monday, but that's a holiday, so they think they've got until Tuesday to send, to get pension reform, which is, um, to, to get that ready. So it's, but it's, yeah, it's a, a real mess. So the House <laughs> is basically, the House leadership is basically saying, well, the numbers don't work out? Uh, yeah, didn't the like, Senate uh, check on that? Well, the, well, I mean, uh, people have checked on this over and over and over again. Has this been, has this been worked on? And they f feel like it's not going to work the way it's supposed to. It's not going to work soon enough. It's not really supposed to work soon. I mean, this is a long-term 20-year plan. But, you know, the big difference here, you know, between the technical education stuff is that the opposition here is probably is not enough to sink this. This thing's, even though there was some, a surprising number of no votes on this the other day, it still sailed through. Only 10 people out of the entire legislature voted against it. And I think, you know, pretty much the same thing's expected to happen in the Senate. They made some minor tweaks to kind of placate some of the opponents. Didn't really happen. But all these stakeholders, the you know the law enforcement and firefighter unions, you know Senator Lesko, everyone is on board with this. So it looks like this probably should be able to get through without much tr yeah, more it's, trouble. Yeah, it's, it's essentially through the Senate passed unanimously. The House made a couple minor technical changes uh, to kind of placate their more conservative members. They voted on it last night, 49 to 10. Goes back to the Senate for a final vote, which is going to be 30 to nothing, and onto this onto the governor. Unbelievable. Do we, do we expect that vote on Monday? Uh, I would think it would happen Monday, yes, and absolutely, could, it has to. Could I add, there's also a, a, a political dimension to this as well. Um, you know, as everyone has said, this was sort of widely 
perceived, yes, this is a pretty good idea, it's the best deal we can get. But you put that on the ballot along with Proposition 123, and you now, the, the mantra will be, we're gonna fix two big problems in Arizona at the same time by going to the polls. And the supporters of the lawsuit settlement, Proposition 123, <laughs> will benefit from having all those firefighters who do have a lot of time because of the way their schedules are structured and a proven history of going out and pounding the pavement, and knocking on mm -hmm. doors, and, and, and bringing out the vote. Right. Well, You've got classroom teachers, firefighters, and police all on a single special election, and they're going to get the vote out. And I have to imagine everyone expects both of these things to pass without much trouble at all, pretty much, you know, sail through to passage, because otherwise, you know, all the education groups, Governor Ducey's office, none of these people would be signing on and giving their blessing for this to go on the same ballot if they thought it was going to even be a hint of a problem. Correct. I believe that's the case. All right, uh, Jeremy, the, the idea of a dollar-for-dollar dollar, uh, tax credit in order to take a firearms safety <laughs> class seems to be gaining momentum? Uh, yeah, it's gaining momentum and moving through the process. This is, uh, this is a new one, even for uh, Arizona, which has kind of been a trailblazer in the loosening gun laws. This would actually give uh, yeah, an up to an $80 tax credit to, uh, for people to get a concealed carry permit. And uh, it's run by uh, Representative Montenegro. Uh, he and uh, other advocates believe this will promote gun safety. People are going to get the concealed carry permit. Most of these people go through training and they feel like this is just going to uh, you know, promote uh, responsible gun usage and more people carrying. Do we know how much this is going to cost? Well, uh, it could cost up to a couple million dollars. I mean, $80 times three million adult Arizonans, you do the math, it's a, it could be a lot of money. Um, and it, the problem is that every time you do one of these things, you have, to, you have to somehow account for it in the budget. Mr. Montenegro says, well, no, it won't be that much. Not many people will take advantage of it, but you know, as we could, if we remember the alt fuels crisis from a decade ago, you should be careful with these tax well, credits. Could, could this be the tax cut that we've been waiting to see? <laughs> no. In fact, on Monday in Ways and Means in the House, there are 10 tax cut bills, all little tiny ones, and the big giant one that we've all expected is still to emerge. That'll probably come out when they come reach a budget deal. So you, there is one still <clears throat> waiting uh, in the wings. There's a big one waiting in the wings. We, nobody knows what it is. It's very hush hush. It's being negotiated. Um, We'll see what it is. Yeah, Governor Ducey, you know, has pledged since his campaign that he's going to cut taxes every single year. He's adamant that he's going to do that this year, but he did not put that in his uh, executive budget proposal. We're he even hearing some chatter it might not be in the actual budget. They might wait till afterwards to take care of that. So that, of, you know, of course, is still coming down the pike. Uh, but as far as this tax credit for firearms instruction, anyone against this? Any fight against this? Uh, Democrats. Uh, yeah. they, 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 you know, Democrats feel like uh, Arizona is too awash in guns to begin with. They don't feel like they don't want to promote of all things, the idea that people should start engaging in firefights in public. You know, the conservative mantra on gun, con on, you know, on you know, Second Amendment is, you know, a good guy with a gun can stop a bad guy with a gun. A lot of Democrats are concerned that, you know, every, you know, every guy carrying a gun is now going to see himself as that good guy with a gun, you know. Someone else pulls a gun, they're going to open fire. Who knows who gets hit in the crossfire? But this is for the concealed carry permit. Um, yeah. Do you do you don't need a concealed carry? Do, how does that work? How, how exactly? You don't need a concealed carry permit in Arizona if you're legally able to own a gun. You can carry a gun concealed almost anywhere. And uh, you can't go into bars. You can't go into most public buildings. You can't go to University of Phoenix Stadium, and you can't go to the legislature without checking. Or your it. school. Yeah. Or your school. Um, but it, this is this is important for people who travel out of state. Oh, uh, there is about uh, two thirds of the states accept Arizona's concealed weapons permit. So if you're going to Utah and you want to take your gun with you, you want your permit with you. If you you can't go to California, unfortunately, because they don't they don't think that our laws are tough enough. Our background. I think the checks governor made a statement to that effect, uh, he, didn't he? He might have. Governor Brown. <laughs> yeah. and I think that um, you know to echo what Jeremy had said earlier that the the rationale for this from the sponsor is that hey, it's better to get people educated so that they don't just you know go carry a weapon because they can, but you may as well get some school. And, and know what you're dealing with. And have background check, I think, to get the permit as well, and you gotta be 21 or, 21 or over, something yeah. along those lines. But the question is, you know, do, should the state be paying for it? And that's what the legislature's wrestling with. Uh, Jeremy, the former lottery director is uh, being investigated, Tony Bowie, and uh, it sounds as though, that, now is this, is the governor's office cooperating with this? Is there, is there, could there be a little bit of a stand? What's going on? It seems like they're cooperating with this. I mean, through their uh, through the lottery department, through their interim director, Kevin Donnell, and whom Ducey appointed to replace Mr. Bowie. Uh, the attorney general's office is looking into uh, some issues with the 
for former director Bowie. They won't say exactly what, but we have a pretty good idea of what's probably out there. Is back in December, uh, a pers an anonymous person purporting to be a lottery employee sent a letter to attorney general's office, governor's office, state lawmakers, media outlets, claiming a lot of improprieties by Tony Bowie, who Ducey appointed last year, like using state vehicles for kind of personal uses, taking his kids in the car with them, firing a bunch of people to make way for buddies, and you know what I think is probably the most serious, couldn't be the most serious thing, is some improprieties with contracts. Now, the AG's office won't say exactly what allegations they're investigating here, only that you know the lottery is cooperating, handing over documents, but I think you know if there's issues with the contracts, that could be the big one. And this, uh, this, uh, the accusations originally published in New Times, this investigation, uh, it sounds like the governor's office is working relatively closely. There, there certainly doesn't seem to be any sort of dividing line here. No, you would, you would think not. I mean, they, they asked him to, to resign. Um, they don't, this is the first big scandal of, of the Ducey administration. I think they want to send a message that, that they won't allow this on their watch. Mr. Bowie, for, her, for his part, has, has denied that he did anything wrong. He says there's a lot more to the story. Um, that's all we've heard from him, and it's being investigated. So. All right. Um, Department of Child Safety. Backlog exists and never goes away. Um, but now there's an idea of measuring it differently, maybe have new metrics involved? Well, yeah, that's coming from the agency itself. And, and their argument is that um, in, instead of focusing on, I think it's now 13,000 plus cases that um, have not been looked at, they've been idle for at least two months, Instead of focusing on that, really what you should pay attention to is as they close reports. So every time someone calls a child abuse hotline, that creates a report. And their argument is that if we can close, and, and often several reports will comprise one case. So their argument is like, hey, if we start knocking off these reports and closing those, eventually we're going to close cases. It makes a lot of sense. We haven't seen that happen yet, but they've been doing this. They've been touting, like, I think, nine of the last 12 months that they've closed more reports than have come in through mm -hmm. the hotline. Um, I'm not quite sure what that says. I mean, I don't know. Are people not calling as much, or are they working really, really fast? But they, they are closing a, a fair number of reports. Right. But we haven't seen that result yet in probably the most important measurement of success, which is, do we have fewer kids in state care? Right. You know, that number hasn't come down. One of the things they asked the legislature to do this week is allow them to change the, is to ask for a change in the law that would require, that would give them a little uh, ease on whether they actually create a report. They get about 135,000 hotline calls a year. Of those, about 55,000 turn into reports, and those reports have to be fully investigated. And, and it sounds as though the two, two basic issues here, if the incident is three years old or more prior to the call, or if the call has, doesn't involve any allegation of current misconduct or current neglect, then what? They don't I don't want to, to say not investigated or NI, <laughs> but, um, well, what? but this would allow them to use some discretion to kind of shuffle that off to the side. Because if you're getting all these calls that, uh, you know, something three years old, no criminal conduct alleged, you know, no allegation that a child is currently in danger. They want the freedom to be able to kind of set that off to the side and not can add on to this giant backlog of reports and cases and whatnot that makes it impossible for and, them to pare down. And to, yeah, it's a prioritization issue. And that to make that happen, they need uh, they need a change in the law. And they got a early, they got a vote um, right. in favor of that from the first committee. Seven to one, seven to one. But Re Rebecca Rios, a Democrat, said, you know what, I. We need to fix the problem of how you can't handle the amount of cases. Let's not do it by changing how many cases go in. The, you know, we're gonna something's gonna slip through. Well, and I just made a, a sarcastic reference and not investigated or NI, yeah. but mm -hmm. that's what got this whole thing started. The yeah. idea that some of these cases were just you know woo, off they go yep. into the distance. But w is there a difference now? Uh, you know, this is the same routine that was used two years ago when the current director blew the whistle on this NI thing. Um, and, and it seems like he's just asking to change the rules. The critics would say he's, he's trying to change the rules so that the numbers look better. When he was brought in to fix the problem in the first place with what you got going. But it's not exactly the same thing because Director McKay says, look, the, the NI scandal of a couple years ago, those were reports that had come in that they thought, we got to do something on right, this. Right. But they were a lower 
priority. I mean, it's very, it is, right. it's very similar. But at, you know, his point is that those earlier reports had been right. sort of somebody had taken a look and said, "Hey, eh, you know, we can get to this later." Right. But what they're trying to do with this, they get 135,000 calls a year. They 55,000 of them make reports. What they're trying to do is take that same number of calls and only make maybe 40,000 reports. Right. right. And so make it easier. So what happens to those 10 or 15,000 you've now decided don't meet? The report standards. Right, and that, and that's a big question at the same time because you know, backlog is just sort of this boat anchor that's been hanging around right. the agency's neck because when the new agency was created, they said, oh, well, you know, we'll get rid of that. Well, we'll get it down to zero, you know, and that was supposed to have happened last July, did not happen. So lawmakers are just up to here. So they are running legislation that would require the agency to hire a private company to get to help them march through all these these backlog cases. But in the process, they're also changing the definition of what is right. a backlog, and that's also we're hearing some opposition and some pushback from the Democrats on that. Getting a new field goal kicker and moving the goalposts at the same time. <laughs> uh, Jeremy Overhaul of the Arizona Commerce Authority. What's this all about? What is the Arizona Commerce Authority? Uh, the Arizona Commerce Authority is basically the old Department of Commerce, but uh, revitalized under Governor Brewer uh, into this uh, public-private uh, agency that is kind of in vogue across the country. Now that Governor Ducey wants to kind of overhaul this thing himself, put his own uh, you know, uh, fingerprints on it. What he would be doing is taking a number of agencies or the f a number of functions from different agencies and combining them into what he would call the Governor's Economic Opportunity Office. And with the GEO, as they're calling it, or the Arizona's own geek squad, as uh, the governor's <laughs> chief of staff put it, is basically you compile a lot of metrics to show how competitive Arizona is and how competitive different cities in Arizona are on you know, tax structure, regulatory regime, that kind of thing. And you know, this would do a couple of things. One, it, was, it would give businesses an idea of how much it will cost them to open up a business or to relocate. The other thing it's going to do is this is going to provide a template for the governor to say, well, we need to cut this tax. We need to get rid of this regulation. Both are hot, big priorities of Governor Ducey, and this will give them kind of some, you know, official rationale to say, well, gee, you know, compared to Texas or compared to South Dakota or wherever, you know, we're not very competitive on this. We need to get rid of it. And you got the Geek Squad, but you also have another faction here that's basically out there for marketing purposes, correct? Correct. So the Commerce Authority and the Department of Tourism right now combined get about $50 million in state funding. Um, not all that's direct general fund money, but that's, that's what they spend. And, but they, they don't, they don't <coughs> have all the tools they need to do that marketing. They don't work together very well. They want to co-locate those two groups along with the Arizona-Mexico Commission, mm -hmm. which does cross-border marketing, and, and, Arizona the, Zanjeros. and the Zanjeros, which is, not sure what they do. <laughs> um, but they want to combine all those things, and, and all of them pull from this governor's economic office for metrics so that they can make better use of the marketing that the state does. So there still will be an Arizona Office of Tourism, uh, still a DES, still a DOA, uh, still a Arizona Mexican Commission, yeah. Zanieros, the whole nine yards, just a little bit of everyone will coalesce into this thing. In into this happy place where they can sort of, you know, work co collaboratively and make sure that they're sort of sending out a unified message and covering a lot of bases. It, and it right. will be a happy place, Jeremy. I, 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 <laughs> not, not discouraging Pre words will not be heard, I don't imagine. Presumably not. Everyone's supposed to get along, you know, very happy, holding hands, singing kumbaya <laughs> and all that. And most importantly, coordinating their marketing and sales strategies. Now, is this something that has to be approved by the legislature? What, what do we do? Yeah, there, there's a big overhaul bill for the Commerce Authority, and that that has got to work through the legislature. As part of that, there's this new uh, Industrial Development, Development Authority. Authority, which is supposed to basically help businesses get lower income loans without the state putting cash in the game. Some cities and counties use this to, to help draw folks. So, so that'll be part of it. Um, they're going to draw from the Labor Department and from the Economic Security Department some of their numbers crunchers to provide the support to the big, it's, it's very complex. I was going to say, someone's going to have to be hired just to figure out what the heck's what going on. Sandra Watson at, at the Commerce Authority will, will be running this operation. All right. Uh, last question before we go. Is there a thought down there? This goes back to some of our earlier. Did the House and Senate, did they get along down there? I, I, I mean, is, 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 are there different tracks? Yes. There are. There was great <laughs> drama that we talked about with, with the, the technical education school districts and with the pension this week. And it just shows that, you know, you have 90 people in the, in the legislature, 30 on one side of the courtyard, 60 on the other. They're, they all have their own agendas, and sometimes they 
don't play well together. Yeah, you often hear, you know, the upper chamber being the Senate <laughs> and the lower chamber being the House, and that, that plays out. There's a lot of ego. You know, the House um, does tend to be a little more raucous um, than the very sedate Senate, and the Senate sort of looks down on the House as, you know, junior high. Yeah, all right. Well, uh, I guess we'll get, let you go back to school here uh, shortly. <laughs> Thanks for being here. We appreciate it. Monday on Arizona Horizon, we'll take a look at how the local commercial real estate market is shaping up for this year. And we'll learn about an art restoration project at the Heard Museum. That's Monday on Arizona Horizon. Discovery. You don't want to miss that. That'll be on Wednesday with Lawrence Krauss. That's it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you.